excited to welcome back our team from Benefits, our experts in our post-acute care rehab part. And today they're going to be talking about, or this afternoon, vision therapy, which was a highly requested topic at the end of our conference last year. So thank you again. All right, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. I'm super excited when introduced with this topic and the request of this topic. A lot of evidence shows that vision therapy is one of the most neglected forms of intervention post-stroke, that most people make their most gains in the first three to six months. And then after that point, most people no longer make gains and they transition to what's that com compensatory strategies, not because they can't make those gains, but because there's just such a lack of intervention. So the more healthcare as a whole can be educated on vision and what to do with said vision deficits post-stroke, would do nothing but benefit our population that we're serving for all these stroke survivors. So this is a topic that I'm pretty excited to talk about today and um, really excited to get started. Um, so for our agenda today, we really wanna break down all the different, not all, but the, the major um, different things that somebody can experience post-stroke. What does that look like and what should you do, okay? Um, so we are going to be diving into left neglect and inattention. We're going to be diving into visual scanning, diplopia, um, double vision. We're also going to be going into some visual field cuts. And then Kelsey and I will be going into some case studies of actual patients that we've treated, what we've done, and how what we're doing is working. Um, so we're just hoping that from this, all of you guys come home with a lot of tools and ways to educate the patients. That's you. So as we go through, we'll be using terms like neglect, field cut, inattention, or just attention, um, and just wanting to make sure that, you know, from the get-go that everybody realizes that those are different things. I think you know, everybody in this room is aware of that, but um, that a neglect is not a field cut, and that's also not inattention. I think um, attention is one of the more um, maybe misunderstood of the three, um, and Commonly, how I'll explain it to patients and families, it's not like pay attention, like you're doing it on purpose, but I am having a hard time attending. Either, um, we you know, often think of this as like a task maintenance or time maintenance thing, um, but it can also be obviously visual and auditory. Lisa will go into that a little bit later, but that for the purpose of this, visual attention is difficulty with attending to what pe people see. So um, why in 2017 did we change our recommendations um, for recognizing stroke from fast to be fast? <laughs> it was a question. Um, <laughs> it's because um, we, um, uh, in the emergency kind of arm of stroke management, they were missing um, strokes in posterior circulation, as we know. Um, that part of the brain operates by functioning um, or helping to have function balance and eyesight changes. So um, that's why um, they include, if you're noticing someone having any balance difficulties or eyesight changes, um, they, we were missing that. So um, and they're saying 20 to 30% of ischemic um, cases can involve that. So um, here's just a little anatomy picture to kind of give you a breakdown of what the posterior cerebral artery supplies um, and why if there is a stroke located in this part of the brain um, that you might see things like hemianus, hemianopsia, um, loss of color vision, cortical blindness, um, inability to recognize familiar faces, um, anything like that. You might see nausea, vertigo, vomiting, um, dysphagia. So, um, just want to keep in mind that a stroke is not a stroke is not a stroke is not a stroke um, and that's why it's important to know the anatomy um, and where things are happening for your patients okay um, so am I on I didn't shirt myself off there I am there I am okay so, um, so visual impairments following a stroke include abnormalities of central peripheral vision, eye movements, and also impaired visual perception. This can also include agnosia, which is the inability to actually visually identify an object. So we really need to know and differentiate what we're looking at here. 
So grossly 60% of those who have suffered an acute stroke will have some form of a visual deficit presentation. And the likelihood that you're gonna have more than one is actually very common. So you need to differentiate what we're looking at and then how we're gonna treat what we're seeing. Um, we also see that visual impairments are significantly linked to increased incidence of prevalence of depression post-stroke because visual deficits also tend to equate to loss of independence, especially if you're a driver and you can no longer drive. And if you all of a sudden can't drive, it's just very detrimental to that patient to lose that piece of independence. So visual deficits really are a key contributor to maximizing someone's overall well-being post-stroke. Um, underlying deficits also need to be assessed or in consideration when looking at visual deficits post-stroke, and this can include cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy. One thing to really keep in mind when you're doing a visual assessment with somebody that has a stroke is if they wear glasses before the stroke, they have to wear glasses when you're assessing their vision. If you don't have their glasses on, then half of what you're seeing might not even be visual deficits from the stroke. It could simply be because they can't see. So make sure that's a big plug that I have. A lot of visual assessments are occurring and somebody's not wearing their glasses. So we need to put some glasses on before we assess. And if you don't have those available, that's where that communication with family comes in to have those brought in so that we can look at that. Um, we also need to take into consideration any underlying apraxia because there is a big difference between a visual deficit and apraxia. So what we likely would see most of all post-stroke is an ideomotor or ideational apraxia. So an ideomotor apraxia is if someone's thirsty and they go to grab a drink, they can just grab it and drink. But if I gave them the command to do that, all of a sudden they can't motor plan how to do it because they were given some verbal instruction, okay? The other thing with ideational apraxia is, let's say I'm getting ready to brush my teeth in the morning and for some reason I also have a razor beside me on the sink, I might grab that razor and try to brush my teeth with a razor versus actually using a toothbrush. So those things can also be presenting as issues with visual, visual deficits. Um, so I just want to say here that we're going to really be focusing on intervention, not diagnostics. I will be doing a little bit of differential diagnostics with this. But I really want to focus on once you figure out what somebody's having visually, what do you then do or how do you interact with this person? Um, we see here that all evidence validates the importance of education on visual deficits post-stroke, and this needs to be the first step. Step one, education. They need to know what they have, why they need to work on what they need to do, and what they need to do to help it improve. If you're just starting to do intervention and you miss the piece of education, that's a huge detriment to the person. So they need to be educated on what they need to work on to address this visual deficit. We also need to keep in mind that a person needs to be treated holistically. We can't just isolate vision and only do vision. And we need to do this appropriately and right have the right kind of heart. I'll be diving into left neglect in a bit, but with left neglect, we want to address vision, but we want to make it harder as appropriate. So just make sure that we're not just trying to only isolate vision because vision is done in the context of functional activity in daily life. Um, we also need to know that vision therapy needs to take other things into consideration. Um, we also need to know their balance or sitting balance. If I'm working on head turns with a visual scan and the person doesn't have any unsupported sitting balance, they might turn to look left and completely fall over. That's not a very beneficial intervention right there. We also really need to take in consideration midline orientation. This is huge and vital, especially for those who are having a severe neglect that's present. We have to have good body awareness and a holistic understanding of our body and space. If we don't have that, we need to address that. Also, the last two are very important. What is their attention span and how can they dual task or multitask? Sometimes people just simply can't do two instructions at once, and they're not doing the visual scanning or whatever you're having to work on because your instruction is just too complicated. So we need to make sure we're really addressing each person individually and making them uh, or setting them up for success. So one of those things that we need to take into consideration um, is right hemisphere disorder. I'm not going to read the slide to you all, but I think just the biggest things, um, you know, remembering that right hemisphere disorder is characterized by notable difficulties in attention or concentration, left neglect, memory, and difficulty with that big picture thinking. 
Um, it's not uncommon when you're working with someone with a, a severe, moderate to severe impairment in this um, area of vision that they don't even see it as a problem, right? That's really common. And that's a huge barrier. So like Lisa was saying, making sure that, you know, I know what to do with this visual impairment, but there might be other things that need to be addressed either at the same time or before um, that visual intervention is um, taken into, um, you know, it, it takes place. Um, I think just in this list, the, the biggest things to note um, is the reasoning and problem solving, that social communication and executive function. Um, so just some things to keep in mind um, as you're going um, through visual intervention with patients. All right. Okay, so I really like to get a do's and don'ts list. So my personality is coming out a little bit on this slide. Um, so with left neglect, I'm gonna start with the don'ts. What you don't tell the person to do is look left. Guaranteed, this is what you're gonna get. And they're gonna stop because to them, this left side is no longer there. So if you're constantly verbalizing or cueing someone to look left, that, that is gonna consistently be unsuccessful. And it's also gonna really frustrate the patient because in their mind, they're doing what you're asking them to do. So what you really need to do, which I'm gonna give on a do, is you need to give them a, a, a really an actual thing to look at. Look at the open doorway that has a big red exit sign, exit sign on it. And they will keep looking until they find the doorway with the exit sign. They need to have actual things to scan and look to. Also, don't give complex instruction. Someone with left neglect is going to have impaired attention, they're gonna be easily distracted, and they're gonna have a hard time following multiple com commands at once. You also don't want to have them doing a lot of things at once. If you're working on unsupported sitting, weight bearing through the affected arm, also trying to do a functional reach task, and then also adding a visual scanning to that, you're, you've, it's too hard, that's, the, that's too hard. They're not gonna successfully be able to do that. So what you're gonna do is assess what they can do and then have the right kind of hard accordingly because we do see a fluctuation. There are people who have that left neglect present but they're more capable of multitasking than the next patient that you work with. So make sure we're being very mindful of that. Another don't that I see often is don't assume that they know the room that they're in. I have people walking people into a room and asking them to visually scan and locate things and they don't know half of the room is even there. So when you bring somebody to an unfamiliar environment that they've never been in before and you immediately start on a visually, visual scanning task, you're setting them up for unsuccess with that. So what you do in this situation is use an anchoring technique where you anchor them visually and actually have them do a full sweep of the room before you initiate any level of visual scanning. So what that could look like for somebody with left neglect is they're motor-wise moving really well. You could actually do some higher level visual scanning and you bring them into a complex room that has a lot of visual stuff going on and then you immediately initiate a visual scanning technique that they, haven't, they don't even know the room. So it's really frustrating for them and it's adding that failure feeling when it shouldn't be there. It's not their fault that they don't know half the room's there. And that's the thing with neglect. Half of it is not there for them. They're neglecting to even understand that it's there. Um, another don't, don't get frustrated. Don't get frustrated. It's really hard to work with this population. They have kind of a 10 second Tom memory. You'll have to rewind them often. And it's not because if it's an intellectual issue, they're just distracted and they're having a hard time maintaining attention. So it's really important to empower the patient to understand that it's okay. It's okay to need reminders and really educate family because that's where a lot of frustration comes from is family feels like they're constantly having to repeat themselves with this person. So really be mindful, don't get frustrated, really think of an encouraging attitude on how great they're doing because this is a very frustrating thing. Um, also, don't increase the complexity too quickly, hindering their ability to follow the instruction. You can't have the right kind of hard and then the next day make it twice as hard. You need to slowly grade what you're doing and their ability to follow your command will be a good idea of the right kind of hard. Um, so also don't forget that left neglect comes with impaired midline orientation. And I have to do a little plug on pusher syndrome. I was treating this as my wish list of what I wish nursing staff, CNAs, or the random healthcare worker would know. So what happens when somebody has left neglect is they no longer have a middle of their body in the middle 
to them, this is their new middle. So you will automatically see them leaning more to the left. And a lot of people look at that and go, oh, they're weak. They're, they're falling to their affected side. Actually, no, they're very strong. If you tried to push them, you couldn't move them. What, what's really happening is they think they're in the new middle. And with a visual um, tool, what you need to do is give visual feedback. Visual feedback is what fixes or works on left neglect. What you don't want to do as a healthcare professional is take somebody that has a pusher syndrome and try to shove them straight. All you're actually doing is making the pusher syndrome stronger. They're just going to get this and this is going to be really great. They're going to be able to hold this for forever because you're making this stronger. So what you need to do is give visual feedback. So if somebody is sitting edge of bed, unsupported, and they still have that prevalent pusher syndrome or going towards the left, simply standing in front of them and asking the question, am I straight? And them saying, well, yeah, yeah, you look straight. Well, do you line up with me? And they'll go, they'll like, no, no. And they'll just kind of fix themselves and line up straight. It's that simple, okay? Also, mirrors are a great thing and sometimes they don't work. If they've got a lot of distractibility, mirrors can really be unsuccessful with this population. I had one patient that had very significant left neglect. I gave her a mirror to put in her room and put a line right in the middle and gave her her own tape of a midline. All I would have to do is get her edge of bed, put that mirror in front of her and she'd go bloop and fix herself immediately. And, she could, and then the goal was sustaining that for a length of time. So with her looking at the mirror, she could maintain that for five minutes. If I added any distraction to that, boom, she lost it. So you've got to measure what you're doing appropriately. Um, and then I've had patients that I put a mirror in front of them and it doesn't work at all. They're too distractible. They can't focus on the mirror and do everything else. Another way that mirrors are really successful is having the mirror in front of them and a person kneel behind them and they can see that person straight behind them and that they're way off to the side. Another plug I have to put with pusher syndrome is if you go to transfer them and you try to transfer them towards the right, they're going to resist you every inch of a mile. You transfer them to the left, they'll help you every step of the way. So if you transfer them towards the affected side, way easier transfer, less staff hurting their backs, and everybody gets away okay. So please do that. <laughs> um, also, don't forget to assess for auditory neglect. I think people don't realize that the neglect can also be an auditory presentation. The reason why this is so important for visual scanning techniques as an occupational therapist, I find auditory to be super successful. So if I go tap on something and have them scan to the sound, that, is, that tends to be the most effective and quick way to get somebody to scan to the left. If they have an auditory neglect, that won't work. So it's a really good cue to assess for auditory neglect. And also, when you're telling family members to sit on the left side, if they have an auditory neglect, they're not going to scan to that person. So you have to add a visual scanning. Locate visually someone with your eyes, then have a conversation if they're not going to auditorily do it. And that's when people are talking on the left and no one's looking at them, that might be a cue that there's an auditory neglect going on. Okay, so now do's. Um, do give instruction with visual scanning. Like I said earlier, look at a doorway. Find the clock in the room. Give them a very concrete thing to look at. Don't just say look left. Another do that is so important is to maintain full neck range of motion. What happens here is people get a tightening of what's called the sternocleidomastoid muscle. They actually start to lose range of motion. When you're only scanning here, people can't look to the left because they can physically no longer turn their head left because their neck has literally gotten too tight. So what I would like to do on this is have somebody laying in the bed, especially in the acute rehab phase, and have them have that tactile cue of turning their head so their each cheek is touching the pillow and have them just get in the habit of doing that. You also need to assess for sensation. If somebody has complete numbness on their cheek, that might not work. But I've found that to be very effective. It's a very concrete thing that they can follow. And it's also something that family can easily help this person with. Um, do use anchoring techniques. So I brought my little fun clipboard. Um, when you do an anchoring technique, you want to be consistent all around the board. So if you're going to use an anchoring technique to help people read, or for their food tray, or to help scan and locate a clock, or doorways in a room, whatever color coding system you use, you have to keep it consistent and always have the same color coding system. If you don't use an anchoring technique, what somebody will do is only read from the middle of the page over every line. What you also can do is different highlighting techniques, all those different things to help with visual scanning. Um, you also, like I've been saying, you need to assess attention and dual tasking. 
this is affected, it's not that it can't improve, and it does improve. So you need to assess that, and you need to make it the right kind of hard. Um, we also want to modify instruction in correlation with their ability to follow commands, as I've said. And then you also need to understand that with left neglect, smooth visual scanning pursuits are the most effective. So an example of this is the lighthouse technique. Anybody familiar with that? Lighthouse technique? Okay. So lighthouse technique is you're looking over your shoulder and you're treating your head like a lighthouse and you're scanning from one shoulder to the other. It's a really good visual feedback, but the problem is, is if this half of the head doesn't work, they might not know they're even looking over their shoulder. So that's why that neck range of motion with a pillow is so important. But with the lighthouse technique, you're doing a concrete visual scanning. I think that as therapists or even as clinical staff, we kind of want to really work on scanning. So we'll give them a scanning activity that's all different planes and really kind of make it almost too hard. So we want to have nice, smooth visual pursuits with left neglect. This is the really important take home that I want to come home or take from this is visual scanning techniques with the focus of head positioning has been found to be the most effective form of treatment for all visual deficits. So if you're working on visual scanning in the context of head position, you are working in the right direction. Okay. So, oh, Kelsey. So, um, I think as far as my piece of this puzzle, I'm most commonly working on visual scanning for reading, for IADL specifically. Can they read their pill bottles? Can they read their bills? So many people read for enjoyment, and it's, it's such a loss after a stroke um, if they are not able to read anymore. And so it's a pretty common goal that I see with most adults um, that they want to get back to reading. And so um, a couple things that I've brought here. So Lisa already talked about the lighthouse technique, um, and this is more for that you know, written task or that fine detail scanning for crafting or whatever it might be. Um, line guides, I think everybody's pretty familiar with a line guide, so if all they need is to block out some information below because they're distracted by it, then just putting something over the top of it that they can slowly move down, um, sometimes that's all people need. Um, that would be my preference initially. Um, it's not so much compensation. I mean, it can build a little bit more towards restoring that function. Um, Blocking or picture frame. So this is another, you know, idea that can be used for both the left or the right side, but maybe they don't need the whole picture frame. Um, this was something that I think I've most successfully used for people um, who read the same paper over, like they get, you know, this paper in their bot mailbox every morning and they, the column is all the same size. And so they're able to use the same exact tool for the entire paper and they don't need help with that. They can be independent with that. And that's huge. Um, the metacognitive approach um, is one of my favorites. Basically, you know, if, if their cognition um, is at the level where they can participate in this, um, if they're reading a bill and they're familiar with the bill, they know that four dollars for their energy bill is too low. So, pointing that out when they I say, okay, how much um, is this bill for? Oh, four dollars. Well, does that make sense that your bill is four dollars? Well, no. Okay, so what does that mean? That means I must have missed something. And as you train that, um, they can, you know, it's not about not making errors, it's about correcting themselves. If they're able to correct an error, they can still be independent. So if they write out a check for four dollars and as they're doing it, they think, well, that's odd, that doesn't seem right, and they go back and they fix it, that's exactly what I would hope that they could do. So the metacognitive approach is quite useful for a lot of things, as you can imagine, you know you know that that sentence didn't make sense. They read it out loud and they go, they have that look on their face like, okay, okay, what does that mean? I think I missed something. And it causes them to you know, look a little bit farther to the left or the right. Um, symbol scanning is used a lot. Um, you might see this you know, as like a piece of paper and it has a bunch of symbols on it and you teach them to go through and mark off this symbol or that symbol. It definitely has its place, especially if their attention is so poor that they can't read a sentence. I mean, if that's too hard, we have to start somewhere. But I would just encourage everyone to tie that to a functional skill or functional task. Um, you know, going through a workbook style um, visual scanning program is not going to be as effective, effective as if you are using that to teach them, we read left to right, or um, did you miss something because at the bottom it says you should have 12 symbols and you've only crossed off eight. Um, you know, using it in a functional way, symbol scanning can be useful, um, but 
a, as a standalone treatment, um, we just want to make sure we're tying that back to something that's everyday life. Okay, so diplopia or um, also convergence insufficiency, double vision, these kind of all fall under the same category. Um, so very common post-stroke to have somebody all of a sudden have an onset of double vision. Automatic presentation, anybody know what somebody will look like when you walk in the room and you, they have double vision? They have one eye closed. They'll always close one eye because if they have both open, they see two of everything. Um, the big thing with double vision that is the biggest hindrance with intervention and helping them get better is headaches. It hurts so much to try to look, to try to focus, and you keep seeing that double vision. So what we see a lot in the acute stage, which I'm going to be honest, I'm not a super big fan of, is they'll just eye patch one eye. And then what that does is just eliminates the vision of one eye. And as fans of neuroplasticity and wanting people to really regain their function, when you just completely cover one eye, that eliminates them to actually start to work on or improve their vision and address the double vision. Um, so what I really found to be an effective intervention for this is partial occlusion therapy. Anybody hear that? OK. I made really fun glasses. So partial occlusion therapy, kind of like I said before, if somebody has glasses and they use those and the prescription glasses, you're going to want to use those. So partial occlusion therapy is taking the concept of understanding that the eye is divided into four quadrants. So you're going to, is that, do I have a fun little red thing? Uh, just pretend, the upper picture in the red. So what you're going to do is occlude the, the lateral quadrants of each eye, whether it's lateral or medial, and you'll do it on a different schedule. Um, so I've done this a lot in therapy with having patients that can't tolerate keeping their eye open, they're always closing one eye, they're always eye patched, and I do this intervention with them, and honestly, I haven't had a patient yet that the double vision didn't completely go away within three weeks. So it's very effective. Um, but what you do is occlude just portion of the eye, so then what you do is when you occlude enough of the eye, all of a sudden the double vision completely goes away. That's how you know you've done it successfully. If you put the glasses on, these, these are not prescription. I have these on the rehab facility for people who don't wear glasses that I want to implement this with. So then I'm going to occlude enough of the eye, and it's a trial and error. I put the tape on, I put it on the patient, and I bluntly say, do you have double vision? Yep, it's still there. And it's almost like a magic, I'm a, I'm a magician. They put it on, they're like, oh, it's gone. And I'm like, yes, that's what we want. So then what happens is on a two-day schedule, I will alternate occluding half of the eye. Because if you just cover an eye and leave it covered, they're going to go blind. So they'll think that they've gotten better, and really they've just completely lost vision in an eye. Um, people will alternate and do different schedule changes with that. But again, if you're always covering one eye, they're actually not getting better. You're just completely eliminating the possibility of them having symptoms. So my first step with uh, double vision is always uh, partial occlusion therapy. And I have had one patient, um, only one, that you'll every two days, I change. So you're covering, I like to start with the lateral portion of the most um, symptomatic eye and occlude that first. And then you'll switch to the other eye on the opposite side. And then so you go lateral, lateral, medial, medial. Every two days you switch. And the really neat thing that I love with that is that um, I, I will go away for four days and come back and they're not wearing the glasses at all. And I'm like, oh, you're not wearing the glasses? And they're like, yeah, it's gone. They said, I don't have double vision anymore, period. That's the goal. That's what we want. Um, the big thing, though, with that is, do you do um, partial occlusion therapy for a patient that's keeping their eyes open at all times and is not having a symptomatic headache? Nope, don't do it at all. This is for the patients that can't keep their eyes open or their headache is so severe that they can't function. But it's really effective. I've actually tried and true, have yet to have that not work, to be honest. It probably doesn't in some cases, but not in my experience. The other thing that I did hand out, I didn't bring enough for all the tables, so if you have one in the table next to you doesn't, can you share, please? It's called the Brock string. I heard someone say, ooh, I love this. Anyone else know about the Brock string? Okay, so Brock string is actually a really fun way for a patient to have visual feedback on whether or not they're actually converging their eyes accurately and correctly. If somebody underlying needs reading glasses and those types of things, they actually already have some impaired convergence. So just keep that in mind. But what you're going to do is hold this right ahead of you. And when you're going to look at the yellow bead, all of a sudden there's a V behind the bead. And when I look at the pink V, or the pink bead, there's a V to it. And I'm going to go back and forth to create a V. 
And then I, I know what all of you guys are asking. If I'm looking at the closest bead and the farthest bead, why is there a bead in the middle? I know, I read your minds. So the bead in the middle, actually, if you focus on that, it'll turn this into an X. And so that is a way that the patient can actually get feedback on, yes, I'm actually doing what my eyes are supposed to be doing, and they know that they're actually converging. So convergence, insufficiency, and Brock string, super effective. Um, so earlier in the last presentation, we were talking about restorative versus um, compensatory. So restorative therapy that I'm mentioning is the partial occlusion therapy and also the Brock string. Those are all ways to restore the impaired vision. That's the reason why I have prism glasses mentioned last is that's more of a compensatory. So now we're compensating. They have double vision. It's not going away. So now you're implementing what's called prism glasses. Um, prism glasses have been found effective with reduction in headache. 90% um, of people who have used prism glasses report that it helped with walking. Um, we do see that long term, about 42% of people who have prism glasses then continue to wear them long term. Um, and I am not a huge fan of prism glasses because to me, if we can fix it, let's fix it. And prism glasses are not, are they're no longer addressing it. And kind of how Jessica was making that neuroplasticity plug earlier that if you want it to get better, if you use prism glasses, it's no longer going to continue to improve. So ideally, this is not my first step. Alrighty, so now to hemenominous hemenopsia or a visual field cut. So with hemenominous hemenopsia, um, the biggest question I have on this one uh, for clinicians is how do you differentiate this, a field cut versus like an inattention versus a neglect? Anybody else have those questions? No? Okay. I'm going to tell you anyway. So um, if you want to give yourself a field cut, like that's a hemenominous hemenopsia, you're going to cover the lateral portion of one eye and the medial portion of the other like this. So if you want to make it, do that to yourself right now, if you don't mind. Sweet. So now you have a field cut, okay? So if I have this field cut, and you can go ahead and now lower your hands. If I have this field cut, and pretend I can't see here, and I do a visual scanning, my vision's gonna kick in at 45 degree angle. Boom, I can see it right here, okay? If I have a left neglect, my vision's gonna likely kick in at midline. That seems to be the biggest difference that I see with a field cut assessment versus um, a neglect. Even in inattention, you can see more of a presentation of they're catching their vision here. It's almost that 45 degree angle is like, oh, I see it right now. That's a very big indicator that somebody has a hemenominous hemenopsia or a vision field cut. The other thing that you want to make sure, again, is you always have glasses on when you're assessing. I'm not gonna, did, I, did I mention that earlier? You got those glasses on. So then the other thing you want to do is assess from lateral. You want to assess lateral. You want to assess one eye at a time, which a lot of people do both at the same time, which you don't want to do. You want to cover one eye, assess the other, vice versa. You also want to assess top to bottom, bottom to top, which tends to be an assessment that we neglect, we neglect to do clinically. We are assessing those lateral quadrants, but as you can see, the eye is divided into four quadrants. You could have a visual field cut in just a quarter of a quadrant. So please do lateral, lateral, and top to bottom, bottom to top. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh, so the biggest thing with hemenominous hemenopsia that you're going to find huge success in is with changes of head position, okay? So those visual scanning techniques are going to be really successful with this population. You want to have your, your interventions be pretty hard because this person is able to follow high-level um, instruction, multitasking, all that's going to be there. Uh, the biggest thing that we have a hard time with, with hemenominous, blah, 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 <laughs> nailed it. Um, the biggest thing that we're having with this is how do you measure if this person's actually improving? That is the really hard thing with vision, is how are, we, how are we making sure that what we're doing is working? Well, a really good way to measure this is increased independence with ADL and IADL tasks. If the person's becoming more independent in day-to-day -day life, you're doing the right thing. Um, the other thing that we really want to have with this is the implementation of a very good home exercise program that should be continually made harder. I think that as therapists or even when we as nurses or whatever we set up, we kind of give them a home exercise program and leave it at there. We checked that box off, right? It's checked. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to continue to assess and make it more difficult as appropriate. Okay. Is this working? Yeah, okay. Um, so Joni asked us to do um, 
the three of us, none of us um, do a lot with return to driving for our patients, but um, I did do some research. We do have a program at Benefis. Um, we're not um, directly involved with them, but I did kind of pull the audience and got some considerations and recommendations for you guys. Um, so there's kind of three tiers and three things that our providers and our staff will look at. So um, what is the Montana state requirement? Um, the Department of Justice here in our state is pretty, I guess there's not a lot of framework and guidelines for people who have visual impairments post-stroke in what you are allowing them or not allowing them to do. Um, really, if a driver has an offense, then they might kind of look at that driver and decide whether or not they should be driving. Um, in fact, our social worker was at the courthouse and one of our patients walked in because they had driven into a building. This was like three months ago um, and was having their license revoked. Um, our provider was mortified. Um, she had given the recommendations, as you'll see in the middle box, what she typically does is says no driving post acute stroke for about six months to a year. And she'll see those patients on follow up. I mean, obviously we wanna get people back to return to driving as soon as we can, but um, kind of in that acute phase, she's just hoping that they'll hold off on that, any independent driving if we find that there's some sort of visual impairments in our assessments. Um, and then what she will do, she'll do those um, visual field assessments that Lisa was describing. She'll do some motor strength testing. She'll look at cranial nerves. She'll look at their ability to dual task. And then she'll do the trail making test A and B. And then we do have an occupational therapy program at Benefis where they will do some driving testing simulation. Um, we also have been lucky enough just to have gotten some virtual reality um, equipment where we're gonna begin to start some of this training for our patients too. But um, our OT at Benefis does three main tests. They do a foot reaction um, test and they simulate between a gas and a brake pedal. Um, and then those norms are adjusted for age and gender. And then they do the AAA road rise review test. So they look at leg strength, they do head and neck flexibility, they look at visual acuity, um, they look at vision under high and low contrast. Um, they look at working memory. They look at how well do they visualize missing information. What's their visual processing speed and what's their ability to search for and find things. Um, and then they also do um, a little multiple choice test from the Montana driver's manual. So they have a very thorough um, assessment that they do and they give those scores to the provider. At that point, the provider can then fill out that um, uh, driver medical evaluation form that you can get at the departmentofjustice.gov. So um, yeah, just wanted to give you guys a little bit of information. Again, that's kind of how we are doing things with our people post-stroke at Benefis, but um, you know, not by any means the gold standard, but what we're doing now and seems to be uh, pretty effective. So, all right, so we're gonna get into um, some case studies. Okay, so uh, patient A came as an outpatient. They had had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. They were 52 years old and they presented with an eye patch that they had been wearing all day, every day over their right eye since, the post, um, since they were discharged from the hospital. They implemented the eye, the eye patch in the hospital and they wore it all day, every day. I mean, the moment they woke up to the moment they went to bed, they had that eye patch on their right eye for three weeks straight. Um, so the biggest thing that is a big deal with that is obviously she is at risk to go blind, which is kind of a big deal. And she had had no education on that. She didn't even know that it was a risk factor or that she shouldn't be wearing an eye patch like that. Um, so that's the big thing that we need to make sure that people are aware of. And the risk factor of completely covering all visual input for one eye for a prolonged period of time is not beneficial for a patient. And I'm seeing actually, if anything, an increased prevalence of this. Um, so with her, there was also that social emotional piece and that um, insecurity piece because post-stroke, her eyelids just did not have a great motor control and she had surgery and her whole half of her face was really swollen. So it just looked, her right eye not only was causing the double vision, and, but it was also very swollen and she could only barely keep it open. And all the eye patch did was make that worse. So what I guarantee you, if they took a photo of her right after surgery and the photo of her by the time I got a hold of her, her eye was more closed by the time I got a hold of her because she's not engaging her eyelids because it's always covered. 
So um, she was probably one of the most significant cases I've seen in quite some time. Um, and ideally, um, I've actually never started the partial occlusion therapy in an outpatient setting. I normally implement and do that as an inpatient. So it was the first time I'd ever had a patient so far post their um, stroke or their surgical intervention and then implemented partial occlusion therapy. So day one, I implemented partial occlusion therapy. The big thing with that that made me nervous, to be honest, about doing it in an outpatient setting is you want to assess all the quadrants of the eye. I've had patients where you cover a quadrant and it makes them way too symptomatic. They don't tolerate it. I've only had that very rare times. So, so in this context, I wanted to assess and occlude all portions of the eye and make sure I had the right amount of cover for each quadrant so that the double vision was going away and she was set up for success. Also really educated family that had brought her and made sure both of them were very clear on this because again, this is something I like to do as a clinician when they're right there on the rehab unit and I can check on them all the time to make sure that two hours later they're still doing okay. Um, so with that, um, partial occlusion therapy, uh, she did it for a week and a half and the double vision went away and she no longer had to wear the eye patch. Again, I keep finding significant success for this. I've, I'm sure it happens, but I've yet to find someone that this does not work for. Um, the other piece was a visual scanning home exercise program and again those anchoring techniques I've just really simplified it there's a lot of anchoring techniques out there that I just can't do due diligence with this presentation but for her she was having a hard time maintaining eye contact with visual scanning she was most symptomatic with visual scanning in the upper left quadrant so when she was up here she was losing it so what I would do is create a board for her to do on her own and use her finger as an, as an anchoring tool to keep her eye on the finger and follow it with her hand and eye motor coordination, but I also had her using the finger as an anchor. She knew if she was doing it correctly if her eyes were fixed on that finger. If I didn't give her that and I just gave the visual scanning home exercise program, she was doing really significant eye jumps. So she would be scanning here, her, lose eye contact, and then jump here and not even realizing she was doing it. So when I gave her an anchor of using the finger with the visual scanning, she actually was able to maintain eye contact. And it was good. And that's what you want. So then the other thing I did do was the Brock string, which I've given you and shown you. And then the really neat thing that I'm falling in love with is virtual reality, because it's really hard to be like, are they getting better? How are we measuring this? I mean, how do you do that? I mean, there's those standardized tests and all that, which are great, but not super functional, because you're not up and moving and doing all these things. Um, so we implemented visual or virtual reality with her. The nice thing with virtual reality that um, I like is it's kind of contraindicated post-stroke because what is virtual reality? What do you think that is? It's pretty stimulating, right? You know, when you really overstimulate the brain, that's not always a good thing. So with the virtual reality, there actually is a tester that they can do first to assess their tolerance of it before you start to use it as an intervention. So we had her, of course, test it out first, and she did great. So um, what I loved with it is for targeting tracking, um, she did a duration of five minutes and 38 seconds. So we can actually measure how long they're tolerating doing this activity. And then we also had a score that we can actually assess, is this getting better, is it improving? So we can continue to do virtual reality to see and measure her improvement. So her score with this was 95.9% um, with um, her holding the gaze. I know that says gave, but it's supposed to say gaze. Um, so when she was able to ho hold a visual gaze and then track, she completed that with 95.5% accuracy. And then the other thing we were able to assess with this was hand-eye coordination. So she was able to continue and do this task for a duration of 6 minutes and 23 seconds, and then her precision of this was 84%. And that's my case study. So this patient B is one of mine. Um, so you know, rarely um, would we just do a screening. This was actually um, an, an outpatient. I happened to be um, floating this day and, and found this patient in the TCU. So um, she was elderly, retired. Um, she didn't have, you know, goals of return to work. However, she did live alone. Um, and she scored um, in the functional range on the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Typically, you know, I would want to do more than just the screening, but she scored really well on it. Um, and But she reported to me afterwards that she felt like the visual scanning, um, visual spatial and executive function portions of that were quite difficult and that she had to try really hard to, to be successful with that. So what we did um, was 
like that metacognitive executive function treatment like I've spoken about previous. Um, for her, because she lived alone, it really was pretty basic. It, you know, you keep going back to medication management and financial management, but that's what she needed to be able to do. And so um, using those skills that she had learned with that metacognitive um, education, we did a lot of IADL rehearsal. And um, she, we also did some visual attention for wayfinding or pathfinding, um, you might call that as well. You know, she could see things just fine, but she would, you know, you'd start her on a story and we would have walked for five miles before she found the thing, you know, realized that she hadn't found the room that I'd asked her to locate. So this was more, again, metacognitive approach, but a lot more um, functional, real life, getting up and moving around and realizing, you know, she might read the number that she was supposed to find and just keep on going, oh yeah, there's room 25, and then I'm like, what were we looking for? Oh, room 25, you know, so this type of, of task is really useful. Um, and usually, I think somebody had asked earlier about awareness activities, and I've been thinking about that a little bit. If they have any sort of visual um, impairment and you do a quick task with this, you know, like this with them and they miss something, you know, you don't wanna make people feel bad, but it's very easy to point this out and say, okay, this is what we've been talking about, you know? You can do this, we're gonna work on this, but I want you to be aware of the fact that you just missed this, this item in your visual field. Um, so those were the three things that um, I found most useful for her. And that is it for this presentation. Questions, anyone? Yeah. What virtual reality are you guys using? Oh, okay. Virtualis is the system. There is an online question also, and it's where else in Montana can people go for the driving assessments? Where else? Yeah. I, I think so the AAA Roadwise is no longer available for purchase. I did find that out when we were doing this presentation. It's like, oh, that's great, people can just buy that, but I guess they no longer sell it. Um, but as far as, as far as other formal facilities, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And it does tend to be a separate cost. So if you have an OT do a driving evaluation, it tends to be a one-time fee of $300 that's not covered under the blanket of therapy. So it tends to be a separate out-of-pocket expense for the driving assessment. Nope. I uh, just want to make sure everybody's aware that the state of Montana has a form. Um, it's called the, hold on, I got to hold it up, but it's the, uh, Recommendation for re-examination. So if you have a patient, anybody can fill it out, but if you have someone who you're worried about their driving ability or their cognitive ability, anyone can fill out a form, send it to the state of Montana, and they are supposed to follow up on whether or not this person should be driving. Because I know often we run into people who shouldn't be driving anymore, and then I don't want on the road with my kids, so. <laughs> yeah, you, you see them three months later and they drove into a building. They drove yeah, into a building. Exactly. So or you drive by the building concerns. and see them. Oh, I know them. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I've done it in the past just because it takes it makes me feel better about what I've done, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely.